And that is all the time we have now for uh, debate. We are going to now move to member statements. I recognize the member from Mississauga Centre. Thank you very much, Speaker. Good morning. <clears throat> As Remembrance Day comes closer and we don on our poppies proudly to remember and honour our brave Canadian men and women who fought for your freedom and ours and often paid the ultimate sacrifice to preserve peace, democracy and the rule of law, Polish Canadians and Poles around the world celebrate November 11th as Polish Independence Day. This year marks Poland's 104th anniversary of national independence, also known as Narodowe Święto Niepodległości. We salute brave men and women who fought and died courageously to preserve Poland's sovereignty. We ponder the numerous struggles Poland has endured over the last century on the road to freedom and self-governance, including 123 years of partitions, the devastation of two world wars, and the hardships endured at the hands of the communist regime. Madam Speaker, throughout all the hardships and wars, the spirit of Poles in their yearning for freedom could not be crushed, it persevered. As Winston Churchill said, the soul of Poland is indestructible and that she will rise again like a rock, which may for a spell be submerged by a tidal wave, but which remains. Here in Canada, Polish Canadians make up an essential part of our national character, making up the second largest Polish diaspora in the world, with over one million Polish individuals who contribute vitally to Ontario's and Canada's economic, social, and cultural areas. Sovereignty and independence are central values of both Canada and Poland. This is why Polish Independence Day signifies personal pride for me. As an immigrant, I am proud of my Polish heritage. I am proud of my homeland, its people, and the fight it had to stand for in order to fight for its freedom. Jeszcze Polska nie zginęła. Long live Poland, long live Canada. Thank you, Speaker. For the statements, I recognize the member from Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. The normalization of the use of the notwithstanding clause should alarm all of us. Prior to this government, the notwithstanding clause had never been used in Ontario. At its inception, no one could predict a government that would override fundamental freedoms in such a cavalier manner. It was designed to be a nuclear option, not a convenient loophole when the work of governing is difficult. In 2018, this government threatened to use a notwithstanding clause to reduce the size of Toronto's Municipal Council, and it used it in 2021 to uphold a law that limited the ability of third parties to advertise during an election, an election that happened this summer and had the lowest voter turnout in Ontario's history. Bill 28 will fundamentally change labour rights in this province. Governments in Ontario throughout history survive strikes. This government has halted collective bargaining before that bargaining even reached an impasse. Today is a day in constitutional history, a day when this government threw us into a constitutional crisis simply because it was inconvenient for them to bargain in good faith. What other matters will be too inconvenient for this government to respect charter rights? This government has put legislation before this House that sections 2 and 7 to 15 are notwithstanding. Section 2 is the freedom of thought, belief, opinion and expression. Section 7, life, liberty and security of the person. Section 15, that every individual is equal before the law and has the right to equal protection without discrimination. I urge every government member to sit down and think about what they will be voting on today. Party discipline is not a matter of law. The fundamental freedoms of people of this province are. Do not support Bill 28. Next, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Speaker. Next week, the legislature will be sitting, will not be sitting, while we observe Remembrance Day week. As we reflect on Remembrance Day, I'd like to speak about a group that has largely been forgotten. Although First Nation individuals were exempt from conscription, between the First and Second World War, more than 7,000 First Nation individuals voluntarily joined the Canadian forces to fight for our freedom. At the time, if someone lived off reserve for more than first more than four years, that person could lose their official Indian status. For many individuals stationed overseas fighting for Canada, Canada stripped them of their Indian status. Yet many of those individuals continued to give back to their community when they returned to Canada. Curve Lake First Nation in my riding demonstrated this. During the Second World War, every single eligible male over the age of 18 volunteered to fight for Canada. One of those volunteers was a gentleman named Murray Waitung. Mr. Waitung is someone I've spoken about in this chamber a number of times. His role during the D-Day invasions 
was to keep the communication lines functioning. When he returned to Curve Lake, he continued to give back to his community. He was known throughout the greater Peterborough County and revered as an elder, a knowledge holder, and a community volunteer. Later today, I'll be reintroducing the Murray Waits on Community Services Award to ensure that the positive message he embodied about giving back to communities will be told to our youth. Member Statements, the member for Waterloo. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now we know why Premier Ford didn't have time to appear before the Emergencies Act inquiry. He was busy preparing his latest assault on the Charter of Rights. Bill 28, which prohibits education workers from striking, also prevents them from petitioning a court to restore the right that was just taken from them. That is, it invokes the Constitution's notwithstanding clause, exempting it from the Charter scrutiny for the next four years. This move builds on a record of distrust by not releasing the mandate letters. Uh, the principle of transparency would demand that the Premier release these letters. He has chosen not to. He has gone to the Divisional Court. He has gone to the Court of Appeal. He's gone to the Supreme Court of Canada. And he's even gone to the courts to prevent the people of Ontario by finding out how much all of these court visits are costing. And that we are learning from his choices against transparency go deeper. Uh, this, premier, uh, this Premier went back to the courts this week to keep the cost of all of these battles a secret. And I bring this up today because the Premier has been asked to testify at the public Order Emergency Commission in Ottawa, appearing would be a simple act of transparency. Once again, he has gone to the courts to not testify. But as a basic act of responsible government, he should choose to release the mandate letters, reveal the cost of the court cases around them, and appear before the Emergency Commission in Ontario. If you want to restore trust and accountability, you actually have to show up and do the hard work. Thank you. Member Statements. The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Well, thank you, Speaker. My statement today celebrates the most renewable and sustainable industry in the world, agriculture and food. Throughout the last number of weeks, I've enjoyed listening to my colleagues' statements in this House, recognizing many summer and fall fairs that have taken place throughout our province. I'm excited, Speaker, to announce the culmination of Ontario's fair season begins this Friday night here in Toronto at Exhibition Place, where this country truly does come to the city. Speaker, the Royal Agricultural Winter Fair is celebrating its 100th anniversary. Since 1922, the Royal has crowned a century of champions in livestock, poultry, equine, and food. Today, the Royal has grown to be the largest indoor agricultural and equestrian event in the world. A win at the Royal is special. Whether you are pickling, making butter tarts, raising beef cattle, marketing, marketing dairy genetics internationally, or showing a six-horse hitch, you'll experience the strength and vibrancy of rural Ontario. Every year, over 300,000 people come to the fair to celebrate the very best food, livestock, and horsemanship Canada has to offer. The Royal is happy to welcome you and your families back in person for the 2022 fair starting this weekend. Come to Exhibition Place and discover the sights, the sounds, and the smells of the Royal Agricultural Winter Fair. And as you want to better understand where your food comes to your plate every day, please come to the Royal. And finally, Speaker, if you had a meal today, thank a farmer. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. This week, the NDP tried to convince this PC government to increase the rates for ODSP and OW. People are hurting. Doubling the rates would make a real difference to real people who cannot afford safe places to live that they can afford, who are in debt to the utility company because they will never have enough to pay rent, buy food, and pay the bills with such a small check, who are celiac but can't afford gluten-free food to keep from getting sick who during COVID could never afford to bulk buy food to stay home more often and had to pay to take transit and take more risks than others, who can never stock up to save money or shop when things are on sale because they're forced to buy what they need when they have the money, they need who need to clothe themselves and their growing kids, kids who more often get bullied, who deserve to feed their family nutritious and real food, who don't want to be forced to live beholden to skeezy landlords who take advantage of their desperation, who need a phone but have no access to credit and must pay the highest rates, usually without data, who don't get extra money to replace their bed or belongings when they get bed bugs from the substandard housing, 
who can't afford a ticket to a hockey game, who would love to see a movie or have dinner out with friends but can't budget for it, who want to live with a spouse or companion without losing their independence or money, who want to work without having that money clawed back, and who want to live but are choosing to die because the torment of poverty is inescapable. Who can survive in today's world on $1,200? No one. Who deserves to suffer in legislated poverty day in and day out with no compassion from this government or end in sight? No one. This government has chirpy and flippant slogans like, the best social program is a job. Well, Premier, those who can't work can't. And for the record, the best social program would be compassionate and fair. Raise the rates. Here, here. Next, the member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, we're being joined today by a contingent from Renfrew County, including Warden Debbie Robinson, a number of municipal representatives, county staff, and local entrepreneurs. Renfrew County is the largest county in Ontario, incorporated in 1861. Speaker, many of my colleagues claim to come from the most beautiful part of Ontario, but I actually do. Today, you'll have the opportunity to hear firsthand just what a fantastic place Renfrew County is. Without question, it is Canada's whitewater capital, as well as being home to some of the most picturesque vistas anywhere in the province. Renfrew County is populated by people who work hard, play hard, and pray hard. The county was built and still relies heavily on our forestry industry. Agriculture is also a key industry back home. And as the world changes and continues to get smaller, tourism is becoming more and more important as an economic driver as well. Today, you'll also have the opportunity to meet with some of the most creative and innovative people anywhere, when, particularly when it comes to the delivery of health care in rural communities. Renfrew County was the birthplace of community paramedicine, a service that has been adopted in many rural areas since. It also created the Virtual Triage and Assessment Centre during the pandemic. VTAC, as it's better known, provides an important medical service, particularly to those without a family doctor. And we are grateful that our government has continued to support it. It could be adapted for use anywhere in Ontario as a permanent component of our health care system. I want to thank our good friends from the county for bringing their message here today and encourage everyone to visit them in rooms 228 and 230 and get yourself a taste of good old Renfrew County hospitality. Thank you. Member statements. Member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Ottawa municipal election recently resulted in the election of three outstanding councillors in Ottawa Vanier. To Rawson King and Tim Turney, I'm excited to continue our record of friendship and collaboration. To Stephanie Plant, I can't wait to see the great things you will accomplish for our community during this term of council. Ça sera vraiment un plaisir de travailler avec toi. It will be a real pleasure to work with you. I would like to acknowledge and commemorate today our Municipal Council, Mathieu Fleury. We used to work together since the day I've been elected as a trustee in 2010. He, was, he has always been full of energy. He always supported our community agencies and opened new opportunities for our youth. Thanks to his dedication, and hard work. We have parks and infrastructures that have been renewed. He played a key role in the affordability question. He made sure Francophone was a part of his work. He took part of many events. I even thought he find a way to clone itself. He worked hard and was a charming person. But I am comforted by the fact that this means you will be spending more time with your young family. So thank you for your service, Mathieu Fleury. Merci. Thank you for your service, Mathieu Fleury. Member statements. The member for Markham Thornhill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to, happy to raise play in the House today speak about the COPD Awareness Month in November. Mr. Speaker, early detection of COPD dramatically increased the life expectancy and quality of life. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is a slowly progressive lung disease that makes life harder to breathe. 
By 2030, COPD is expected to be the third leading cause of death in Canada and around the world. Mr. Speaker, I spoke to many general practitioners, family doctors, respirologists, specialists in lung disease, and organizations such as COPD Awareness Canada and the Lung Association of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, after my research, I came to know that many times the patients are not aware that they are suffering from COPD. Mr. Speaker, COPD is characterized by narrowing of the airways that make breathing increasingly difficult as a disease worsens. Everyday simple tasks that we take for granted, walking up the stairs, getting dressed in the morning, carrying the grocery from the cart to the front door, doing house chores, and feel deliberating for those with COPD. Mr. Speaker, majority of the case COPD is diagnosed in people over 40 years of old. The most common symptoms include cough that lasts longer than three months, coughing up, feeling sort of breath while doing routine activities. Cigarette smoke is the number one cause of COPD and accounts for approximately 80 to 90 percent of the all new cases of COPD, including others. While COPD is incurable, it is possible to treat and manage. The diagnostic test called spirometry test can detect the prevent of COPD. In Ontario, approximately 10 percent of adults, or 900,000 Ontarians, according to the Lung Association, are living with COPD. Mr. Speaker, my private member bill 157, COPD Awareness Day Act 2021, was received royal assent on June 3, 2021. According to the bill, third Wednesday in November of each year was proclaimed as a COPD Awareness Day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One more member statement. The member for Sarnia Lambton. Thank you, Speaker. <clears throat> Speaker, this week marks the beginning of Diabetes Awareness Month in Ontario. Every three minutes, someone in this country is diagnosed with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. In the next 10 years, diabetes, both type 1 and type 2, being diagnosed will increase by 26 percent. For those living with prediabetes, about half will develop type 2 diabetes if no intervention is made. The medications, devices and supplies required to treat diabetes can cost people thousands of dollars annually. One quarter of people living with diabetes have reported that these additional costs affect their adherence to their prescribed treatment and regimens, which has significant risk to their short and long-term health benefits. Diabetes also adds immense costs to our health care system. People with diabetes are over three times more likely to be hospitalized with cardiovascular disease, 12 times more likely to be hospitalized with end-stage renal disease, and almost 20 times more likely to be hospitalized for a non-traumatic lower limb amputation compared to the general population. Improving the health of people with diabetes will have a direct impact on the costs associated with the disease. The cost burden will decrease with improved prevention efforts and better care as more people with diabetes will be diverted from acute care and will enjoy a higher quality of life with increased function and productivity. We need a provincial strategy for people with diabetes now more than ever. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. That concludes the time we have for member statements this morning.